All, good job that all our ways are known to him and uh, we don't know the way it's a great song to sing at the beginning of the year as well I thought that we could have sung it last week couldn't we first Sunday of the year all my ways this year are going to be known to you and it's great to know that our God is ruling and reigning the, the rejoice the Lord is King I hope you're rejoicing this morning I know it's difficult when it's a bit chilly but I hope you're rejoicing this morning and um, I hope you're even no matter what our circumstances are we know that the Lord we can, we can know the peace, so what peace that I have found. I hope it's true for you this morning. Anyway, we're going to pray now. We're going to come before the Lord, and Elban is going to come. And... Shall we pray? Our most gracious, kind, and loving Father, we come before your presence this morning, God. We praise you and glorify your name, for you are a great God, the creator of heaven and earth. Lord God, this morning... Uh, we praise and glorify your name for the past years, O oh God, for preserving our lives last year, O oh God. Lord, that is the book of Ephesians, uh, a Philippians said that we are leaving the past behind and we are moving forward this year, O oh God. Lord, whatever circumstances we may face this year, O oh God, we bring it all to you, O oh God. For me, we know that you are... Uh, you, we are plan, O oh God, in our life, oh Lord, whatever circumstances, whatever it is, O oh God, whether it be financial or health, we know that we are safe in your hands, O oh, oh, oh Lord, because you are the preserver of our life, O oh God. Lord, we thank you for this congregation, O oh Lord, this morning, that they have time to come together, together, O oh Lord, this morning, although it's... Um, a beautiful morning, O oh God, that we can see another day, another life to endure, O oh God, that we are still <coughs> breathing, O oh God, and enjoying the day, O oh God. Lord, we thank you for this life that you have given to us, that we have hope, O oh God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, that give us eternal life, O oh God. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Will for imparting to us today, this morning, may you give him more wisdom and knowledge, O oh God heavenly wisdom as he will impart to us the message this morning about the book of Ephesians oh God we know that through the life of Paul that you reveal the mystery to him that we are no longer alien to the commonwealth of the Israel oh God that we are now in one body in one unity in the faith that we are now the seeds of Abraham oh God through the faith in Christ Jesus and through him you unite all the body oh God Lord we thank you for this the body of Christ that we are we have unity in the faith lord we thank you oh god that um, this church oh god that they keep on going oh god in spite of all the circumstances that the persecution of christian all over the world is rampant oh god we know that we are now in the last days that uh, people were now departing from your word as you as in the prophecy oh god but we know that you, your word will remain forever, O oh God. 
as you said that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will remain. Lord, this morning, open our eyes, open our hearts, so that we may seek your <clears throat> word, like the sheep that looking for this pasture of God. Lord, fill us the emptiness in our life. Make us more thirsty in your word, O oh God, that they may seek your word every day in our life. You know that everything in this world is temporary, O oh God, that we are a sojourner in this world, O oh Lord, that we know that our definite goal is to be with you in heaven, O oh God. Everything will pass away, the material things, the world, the fame, O oh God, but at the end of the day will come back to you again in your holy hands, O oh God. Lord, we thank you, O God, for the salvation, the gift of salvation that was given to us, O God, and by the suffering of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, everything we bring back, all the glory and praises into your name. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Instructions for Christian households. <coughs> Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Saviour. <coughs> now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present herself to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless in this same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies he who loves him he who loves his wife loves himself after all no one ever hated their own body but they feed and care for their own body just as Christ does the church for we are members of his body for this reason a man will leave his father and mother <coughs> and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh this is a profound mystery but I am talking about Christ and the church however each of each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect his, her husband <coughs> Good. Let's pray, shall we, before we come before God's word. Lord, we pray that you be with us now as we open this word together, as we seek your face, and as we try and understand what you're saying to us through your Holy Spirit, and grasp hold of some of these truths that are in your word this morning. And not only that they would be knowledge for us, Lord, that they would they, your word would impact our lives and change our hearts and rule our hearts, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now this passage isn't one that you'd choose necessarily to preach on every Sunday, is it? Um, for, for obvious reasons, and I think it becomes apparent as we're looking at this, uh, you know, that, that, um, that the reason we're looking, obviously the reason we're looking at it is because it's part of, this, part of this book, this letter to Ephesians. And it's, and it's, it's, it's um, as Paul has been looking at, like we started last week in, the, in the chapter 5 about living in the light. And for living in the light, what that means is living, according to verse 1 of chapter 5, living in the light of what Christ has done for us and imitating him. And so that's what the challenge is for us all as Christians and what God calls all of the world to do, to submit to Christ, to submit to him, to submit to his rule and to confess our sin and to trust him with our lives and to commit our ways to him. And so uh, we come to his word and we read his word and his word is authoritative or we say that it is. And then we apply that to our hearts. That's how we keep on living for Jesus. But then we come to verses like we've read today and we think, oh crumbs, that's a bit difficult, isn't it? Because not necessarily because we would find it difficult or maybe we do, but actually it's because the world finds it difficult. Because everyone outside of Christianity, everyone on the side of the world finds these verses difficult so we're going to you know engage with that over the next couple of weeks so it, it, Paul talks about three areas in these in this passage right up to chapter six as well into chapter six down to verse uh, nine and it's uh, the home it's in work uh, and uh, in the world okay they're the three areas at home with uh, husbands and wives and marriage he addresses marriage and this is how it should be 
And he also addresses um, children and parents. And he also addresses then the world of work. And he actually addresses it in the framework of slaves and masters. And what we have to remember is this letter was written to real people in a real time. So let's get that right. So this, as we said last week, a lot of the things that Paul talks about in any letter that he writes are obviously applicable to that particular church that he's writing to. These are issues that are coming up in the church. But obviously, because God has allowed it to be part of his word, the principles that are there are applying to us as well. So therefore, whilst some of the things like slaves and masters in particular, some people try to read those verses as a kind of commentary on slavery. And there is a sense of it, it's a commentary on slavery. And, and what, what, But some people have misinterpreted them and said, well, Paul's talking about slaves and masters as though he approves of it. And he's not doing that. He's just addressing a situation that they all lived in at the time. But there are principles in terms of work that we can apply, and we'll do that. Um, but we're going to start a little bit further back. We're going to take two weeks to get going on this. And the first week, this week is kind of an introduction because there's a lot of things here that we really need to get hold of. And there's some really, really basic, absolutely vital, important things that we need to grasp hold of that I think most of us would probably own. But whether we'd be a little bit more in these days, a little bit more embarrassed about what we believe and perhaps a bit you know, shy to be able to share it with other people. These are the verses that we often avoid in the Bible because we think they're actually a bit challenging and we don't know quite what to do with them and how to engage with a culture that doesn't believe it. But obviously, if this is God's word, we should boldly proclaim it and boldly believe it too. So what, what do we need to do about that? And we're going to look at that this morning. Living in the light, last week we looked at living in the light of God's holiness as people living lives that glorify God. And the whole message of Ephesians is, look at what God has done for you, so live your life in the light of that. You can, you, and you can do that, you can live a holy life, and you can please God, because God, has, through his grace, has brought you to himself. And he's conditioning you and helping you to do that through his Holy Spirit, through his word. So you can do that. So the second half of the book, as we, of, the chapter, of the letter, as we've been saying, is really a, a, a lot of what we call imperatives, things that Paul says to do these things. But he doesn't start there. He starts with what God has done for us. And therefore, because God has loved us and in his grace and his mercy, is looking after us and, and, and equipping us and helping us. Therefore, we, we need to make every effort, if you like, as he says to us as a church, to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, to build on our relationships. And when it comes to the home and work, we need to follow God's good example and God's good design. And that's really what this chapter is all about. So um, last week we looked at living in the light of holiness means living in the love of God's family. Verse 1 and 2 of chapter 5. We live, live in the light of holiness lives, means living in the light of God's um, holiness in our behaviour. So our behaviour and the bar was set really high. And the bar is set high all, it, it, all the way through the scripture. And particularly in these chapters here. Paul, you know, talks about that there's a high bar of kind of how we can submit to God and how we can uh, obey him. And uh, so it should be, because if God is God, he needs to be perfect. And what this high bar tells us is that all of us are sinners and we're not all going to make it. We need to understand that. But we have, as Christians, we have a way to come back to God to ask him for his forgiveness in all these areas. But we talked about behaviour last week, didn't we, the different things that we should how we should present ourselves to God, and then how we should present ourselves to each other using the language of, God, of the Holy Spirit. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. And uh, this week we continue the theme, living in the life at home, as I say. Got, uh, difficult passages, and it's not easy to do. And the, word, the verse that Mandy quoted for us is the one we're going to perhaps concentrate on more this morning, and then we'll look at how we unpack that the rest of the chapter, in the light of this. So verse 21, start of that passage Liam just read for us, says this, in, um, in the NIV, it says, you've got to put two, two things there, because we don't know where this verse goes. Does it go, come at the end of the previous section? So live a life of holiness, submitting to one another, as it says in the ESV, out of reverence for Christ. But that's where they put it. But if you've got an NIV, it's the start of the section that talks about submit to one another, out of reverence for Christ, it's like as though he's starting a new section. And the truth of the matter is, it is, the, it, it is very fitting for it to be the end of one section, and it's also very fitting for it to be the start of another, because this verse links both of these things together. All of our behaviour, whether it's in holiness, outside of the home, and just in general life, all of our behaviour with one another, 
all of all of the, the the things that we do, these imperatives that we're meant to live, come out of the fact that we submit ourselves to Christ first, but also we submit to one another. And notice the verse is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that really means out of understand out of out of understanding what Christ has done and how he submits to his Father and following his example, as verse one of the chapter said. So we're going to look at what submission means and answer the question that Mandy asked for us this morning uh, in, with the kids and she's looking at it upstairs so if you've got kids and they're upstairs they're going to be talking about it. It's good for you to talk about this with them when you go home what it really means. And as I say submission and understanding this word because submission is, is not an easy word for in this you know we've seen the pictures that Mandy had but in the world today people don't like the idea of submission. People push back against it. And part of the reason why they do that is because the people we're asked to submit to aren't that trustworthy. Submit to your leaders, your politicians and things like that. Well, you know, we know what they're like, don't we? Some of them, you know, and, and the ones that we seem to hear about. And the, the problem is that the, when we're submitting to one another, we're inevitably going to be submitting to another sinner who is not perfect. And that's why Paul says, do it out of reverence for Christ. Not because they're great and they're pure and holy and they're totally trustworthy, but out of reverence for what Christ has done and what Christ has said. That's what it comes to, doesn't it? So verses 1 and 2 go back to the beginning of the chapter. Follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, live a life of love just as Christ loved you. And we looked at this phrase last week and submission really is summed up in this phrase. The phrase that describes Jesus here. He loved us and gave himself up for us. And ultimately to describe... <coughs> Um, submission is to say it's giving ourselves up for one another like Jesus, living like Jesus out of reverence for him we give ourselves up for each other not because the person you're giving yourself up for is totally worth it because they're not perfect, they won't be they'll be a sinner just like you but because Jesus asks us to do it to follow his example and that's why we do it that's the, that's the motive for it, if you like. Philippians 2, verse 4 onwards, um, talks about that wonderful passage about uh, talking about when Jesus comes from heaven to earth. He gave, he made himself nothing. He humbled himself, even unto death on a cross. Jesus didn't do it, no matter what you hear, because, do that because you're worth it. He did it because he obeyed his Father's will and promise. Yes, he loves us. But he doesn't love us because we're worthy of his love. He loved us even while we were his enemies. And we wanted nothing to do with him. And folks, if he hadn't done that, we would be lost forever. But he loves beyond. There's no worthiness that comes back from us. We are unworthy sinners. So I love Peter's reaction when Peter's in the boat with Jesus. And he's doing all these amazing miracles. And Peter just gets it. And he says, Lord, I am not worthy to be in your presence. He's not doing it in a kind of faux, respectful way. But what he's saying is, look, I see your holiness and I'm nowhere near that. And I shouldn't be anywhere near you. You shouldn't have anything to do with me. I'm not worth it. And folks, that's how we all have to come to Jesus. Isn't it? But it's how, the wonder is that he comes beyond that and reaches across that. And brings us into his family anyway. And saves us and makes us clean. And so the person Jesus is asking you to submit to is actually a sinner. But, he's, but he or she, hopefully, if they know Jesus, has been saved by grace. And, and made clean by, the, by um, the blood of Christ. So it's the fruit, in a sense, on one sense, going back to this verse again, it's the fruit of being filled with the Spirit. If we're filled with the Spirit, we'll have the same mind as Christ, and we'll want to submit in the way that he does, both to our Father in heaven and to one another. And we will want to be like Jesus. The Holy Spirit wants us to make like Jesus. Like Jesus. So that's his work in us. So that's how it goes, isn't it? And follow his example. And so verse 18 and 20 of this chapter give us the means, the reason why we, we should um, submit to Christ and submit to one another. And verse 22 onwards, which we've just been reading, is the fruit of that. So this is what submission looks like, doing it Jesus' way looks like when we submit in the home or at work or as children and parents. But ultimately... It's to God, isn't it? And it's, it's right what Mandy says, what we need to understand is this submission word is never forced. God will not force us into submission. He'll kind of love us into submission. He'll draw us into submission. 
He leads us there, but he will never force it. And when we're asked to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, it's never good if somebody's forcing that submission. There's a lot of things in the church today, a lot of things that are mentioned and talked about, spiritual abuse, but are various other types of abuse. Submission to authority or submission to any authority should never be, in a sense, that kind of forced submission, except when it involves perhaps law and order and things like that. But, you know, it, it's, it's when we submit, the thing we need to understand is that we are in control of that. We are the ones who choose to submit to somebody. I decide who I submit to. And God gives us that um, it's a gift that we have that we can do that so we choose to submit to christ because he's wonderful we submit to one another not because they're wonderful or they may be but out of reverence for who christ is that's why we do it that's why we follow these words here isn't it out of reverence for christ that's the motive because he is worthy it's his way it's his example our submission is always ultimately to christ and not just to the people concerned and so our heart should be one that is ready to submit to him, shouldn't it? And we submit to Christ through his word. How, we, how do we submit to Christ? We submit to him by obeying his commands. Jesus said, you will love me if you keep my commandments. It's as simple as that. Do the things that I say. Trust me as God who is able to give you everything that you need and submit to my word. And the word we have today is the Bible that we have before us. And so that's why this is very important. We can't hope to submit and, and to live godly lives in our homes and in the work unless we learn to submit to God's holy words, even the difficult bits. Because Paul says elsewhere to Timothy, doesn't he, in chapter 3 and verse 16, a verse we all know probably very well, all scripture is God-breathed, is inspired by God, and is useful for us teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, that the, the man of God or the woman of God will be fully equipped for every good work that we need to do we'd be fully equipped to be great husbands and great wives if you like in this context or great employers or employees we'd be great at being children and parents of children how do we do that we do it by submitting to god through his word through the holy spirit illuminating his word in our hearts so last week we said that's how we're filled with the spirit isn't it we're filled with the Spirit when we submit to God's Word and the Holy Spirit points us to God's Word and God's Word leads as, as He illuminates it in our hearts. He fills our hearts. He fills our sails and drives us along and directs us. That's the way. That's what being filled with the Spirit's all about. We are filled with the Spirit through the Word of God. We are also filled, as I say, in order that we can submit to His Word. It opens our eyes so that we can understand His Word and submit to it. So it's all linked together. But submission, as we said, is countercultural, and Paul is going to ask us and talk to us about doing it God's good design way, if you like, in these areas. Submitting to one another in three areas, as we said, in our marriages. Submitting to one another as, as Christ and the church and that relationship. We'll come to that in a moment. And in family, with children and, and parents. Notice, in all these, when he says submit as husbands and wives, it's as Christ, yeah, as in Christ as unto the Lord with children and parents in chapter 6 and verse 1 it's the same thing it's as unto the Lord and work for masters and servants it's under you know it's as you would do it to the Lord again all of this is out of reverence and uh, respect if you like and understanding that ultimately we're doing this because we submit to Christ and we do that by obeying his word and some of us will bristle at some of these words. The world doesn't want to know any of these things, particularly when it talks about marriage. And, and some of the words in these passages, as we'll see, are like lightning rods. Wives, submit to your husbands, uh, uh, as, and he's the head of the family, and he's all this kind of thing. Well, that's kind of, but most people in the world today would not have anything to do with that and don't like it. And even some Christians struggle with it. And, uh, but this is what God's word tells us, isn't it? So we'll look at that more in detail next week. But we need to know why we would do this. Why would we be and live this countercultural lifestyle that the, that the Bible says? And why would we do it on anything? But sometimes what, you can understand why the church, why, why, why the world would kind of reject this kind of thing. But, we, but actually in the church today, it's also something that's changing. And the church of all people, all people in the world, ought to be people who trust and submit to God's word. It is God's word. It's God's good design. And we have to ask the question this morning, are we prepared to submit to all of the things that God says in his word? 
It's God's word. Are we willing? So look at this, the Bible. And so the, the battle for all of these things, for sexuality and what we think about that, what we think about marriage, what we think about family life, what we think about all these different things that are current things in the world today, ultimately comes back to a battle for, if you like, or a discussion about the authority of God's word in our lives. It's not really the issues are part of our issue, only become issues because we begin to doubt or not trust in the word of God. But otherwise, God has been very clear about these things. And if we submit to his will, we'll know that. So we look at these three areas, as we say, and they all clash with our Western culture in particular, and especially marriage and sexuality and how we and where sex is and how, what, what part sexuality plays in our lives and all of these different things and gender issues and all of those different things are all problems because we've decided to walk away as a society from the things that underpinned our society and in one time in the past it was christian values they still are generally speaking but but and you can understand that society has perhaps wandered away from that because their society is always going to be opposed to god's word in one sense because they've chosen a different way they've chosen to submit to, to themselves but when it comes to the church we should be very careful about where we stand on these things. And sadly, so many parts of the church have compromised in these areas. So what are we going to choose? Who are you going to choose to submit to? When we read these words in a passage like this, who are you to choose to submit to? The world and the cultural things of the day and what they say is right because it feels better and it's easier to submit and agree with them or go along with what they're doing or to God's word, the Bible. Because that's what we have, isn't it? And that's the real issue behind all these things. And I think that was the real issue in Ephesus, just like it is for us today. They were struggling with their marriages, and there was a lot of infidelity going on, a lot of sexual activity outside of marriage, and, um, and all of those things in different ways. There was all sorts of th those issues there. That families were dysfunctional in every way. It reminds you a bit of our lifestyle today, doesn't it? The world that they had was, was seemed to be completely out of kilter with everything. And people were struggling. People were being hurt. Families were broken down. This was not a good society that they were living in. Those who, um, some people did very well and some people did very, very badly. There were some people in Ephesus who were extremely rich and powerful and did very well out of all of this and exploited and and. Uh, those who were very, very weak and very, very poor. And the poorest of all were the children who were abused ritually, regularly and, and approved of. This was a debauched, terrible society. And Paul's writing these things into that. And what he's pointing out is the reason it's like that is because you've chosen not to submit to the God who created us and his word, but you're submitting to your own ideals. And folks, that's our society today. It might not be as bad as all of that, but the reason it does the things that it does and we recoil at them is because it is standing outside of God's good design. They're trying to create, as we've said before, the world is trying to recreate what God has already given us. And that is, he gave us heaven and we re rejected it. And so we try to recreate the world in our image and, 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 sort, uh, and sort the problem and satisfy our longings and desires and things in the way that we want. We don't want to submit to what God says generally speaking. And that's why we feel so out of touch. If you're going to go back to God's word and trust it, we're going to be at odds with society. It's going to clash. It will do. And so this has huge implications. And one, as I say, the biggest back battleground is in this area of the home and marriage and family and sexuality and things. But ultimately, the battle is not taking place with people. And that's why we should never sit in judgment on the world and on people. What we do, what we realise is, and we're going to look at this in a few weeks' time, chapter 6 and verse 12, says this. Our struggle as Christians is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, we need to believe that. We need to own it and recognise that this battle is beyond us. That the reason the world is the way it is, and the reason we struggle with it, and the reason we struggle to live in this world and live according to God's word is because there's a massive battle going on in the heavenly realms that we don't really see but we definitely experience it you get your paper out of the morning and read all the stuff that's going on in there and the stuff you go on the internet and as Mandy was saying you can have a very innocent looking word I want to what, give me some ideas about what submission is and you, you know the, what you might see is something very different to what you would expect because that's what God, God has, the world has taken what, we, what in, in essence was good and harmless and made it and corrupted it in every way. 
So the world has corrupted what we think about marriage. The world has corrupted what we think about sex. It's corrupted how we think about our children and families. It's corrupted everything because it's this battle going on in the heavenly realms, waging war against everything that is to do with God and his word. So that's the reason behind it, and we need to understand that. Now, it doesn't mean to say that we need to, we've got, we'll talk about the armour in a week or two's time, but we don't go out and look for these battles. This battle is all around us every day. Every morning you get up, you will be in this battle. It's part of what we are. We're, we're swimming in it all, excuse me, all the time. So we need to be aware of it. We don't need to be afraid of it. But more the more reason why, as Christians, we need to be stand out, like we were saying last week, in our behaviour, but also in our submission to God and his word. So in a very real way, it's a bit like Joshua with the people when he renewed the covenant with them after he'd come out of Israel, after come out of Egypt, and they settled in the land. And Joshua said to them, you need to choose this day. Who will you serve? As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. But what about you? And we have a choice to make. And we make those choices many times each day. So we'll get to all that spiritual warfare thing in a week or two's time. But look at these areas. Who are we submitting to in these areas? In the area of how you live in your home, who is in charge? Who are you submitting to? Um, and whether is, is it God's word or is it what the world tells you should be your values in your home? In your workplace, it's the same thing. What, in, in the church, how does it work out for us here as well? Are we putting God's word in the dock and saying, I don't really like some of the things that you're saying in your word, Lord. I think you could have done it better. And we're, we are standing in judgment on God's word. Or are we submitting to his authority because of his love and his perfection? God's word, the Bible tells us, uh, uh, all the way through, is inspired. That verse we read before, it's God breathed. God's word is not just God speaking some word into some writings that men have written down. But the word, the Bible that we have, is God's word. It's not just... Uh, human ideas infused with some sort of divinity as I've written but it's some it's, it's divine revelation that was given to us through human hand this is the very word of God that's what we believe so the Bible doesn't just contain God's word it is God's word and without that we have nowhere else to go we're just in the soup of thought and lies and everything else that everybody else is but we have God's wonderful delight living in the light of God's wonderful word illuminated by the spirit so it's not surprising the culture clashes with it because it will always do that it's perhaps more surprising that it happens in the church isn't it all scripture is inspired by god and it's profitable it's there for us to be trained in righteousness and we say we believe it all of us he would say we believe the scriptures but then it comes and says to us wives submit to your own husbands as to the lord and all these different things that it says going through that that passage and in our culture, it's like a lightning rod, isn't it? You know, because, and because we're sinners and because we've departed from God's word. Bishop Ryle, who was the first, J.C. Ryle, one of the first bishop of Liverpool, he said this about God's word, and, and it's true. If Christians have no divine tool to turn to as the basis of their doctrine and practice, they have no solid ground for present peace or hope, and no right to claim the attention of mankind. We're just saying the same thing as everybody else. And a church that compromises on obeying God's word will not have a message to preach to the world. It'll be saying the same thing. It's just that the world don't have to get up at half ten on a Sunday morning to come and hear it. They could hear it somewhere else. We need to be different. And we need to live different lives. It's a proper challenge for us based on our submission to the word of God in this way so how should we think about human relationships at home marriage children in work in church if christ and his words his word isn't our authority who is who are we listening to and the answer is probably yourself if you're not listening to god's word you're listening to yourself more than anything else because we just choose the bits that we like that's often the case isn't it and the church a lot of churches going down that route are we going to go down that route as well? We just choose the bits that are palatable, that we think are palatable for the culture. We'll go with them. But actually what you're believing in then is yourself rather than the word of God itself. 2 Timothy 3 verse 14 and 15, the verses just before Paul, that famous verse about Scripture being inspired by God. 
Timothy, Paul's giving Timothy some advice as a young man in the faith. And he says this to him, As for you, continue in the things you have learned and have firmly believed. Continue in the things you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned them and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are may able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. There's no other way, folks. So how, what, how do you feel? I mean, I'm sure if I asked you this morning, how do you feel about, oh, yes, I believe the Bible. I believe, but how do you cope with the bits when, when where are you going to stand when it could, clashes with the cultures around you? In your family, uh, in your workplace, in your school, if it's that way, in, in, in wherever you go, we're going to be at odds with that. What are we standing on, folks? Who are we submitting to? It's only got to be God's word, hasn't it? Now, I know in many ways I'm preaching to people who are converted to this. But we, it, this is a battle that's going on and it's something that we fe I felt we needed to deal with before we... Because unless we agree on that, then when we talk about marriage and things, then it, it's just what the Bible says. It's just one view of it and it's kind of how we should... You know, that's just one view, but there are other competing views which are just as good. What we're saying is, no, we don't believe that. We believe that to submit to God's word means that God's word is enough and complete. And however hard it is sometimes in the culture that we live in, we're going to follow that. We're going to submit to what God has said to us. And that's how we roll. That's how we do it. And God will help us through his Holy Spirit. So, in a general sense, first of all, what does the Bible say about marriage? Let's look at this. What does the Bible say about that in our world today? Marriage by God's good design. And it's come up on the screen behind me. Probably. It's a huge battlefield today, isn't it? A huge area of contention in our culture. It's really, as I say, it's really, as I said before, a matter of whether we have believe biblical authority. And in the church, there's so much discussion about it. What should we do about marriages? What should we do about same-sex marriage? Should we, you know, bless them or whatever? What should we do about all these different other aspects of things, different other types of relationship and what have you? But the Bible has always been and always will be very clear about what marriage according to God is. What we need to understand is marriage was not mankind's idea. Mankind didn't wake up one day and said, wouldn't it be great if we promise these things to one another in marriage, if we come together in that way? Marriage is God's idea. And it goes right away back to creation, when he created us. Um, and it's, it's all to do, so it's very clear from the beginning. It's not just about, so the way we look at it in the West, and it's not in all, all around the world, but the Western view of marriage is it's about two people romantically falling in love sailing off into the sunset together and being married. And, and even that's been changed recently. It's more about what you can get out of it. But, but it's not, the marriage service is all about what we give to one another. I give you my pledge, uh, yeah, I give you this ring, I give you my uh, word, I, I, my troth as we scup. I'm going to try not to use the old words, but pledge my troth, whatever that is. Not a troth, a troth. And, but I mean, I prom I'm making promises to one another and it's all about giving to each other. But what Western society has turned marriage in is generally what we can get out of it. Will this person satisfy me forever? It's all about that. And so I'm the centre of my world again, isn't it? But marriage is God's idea. And it's not just about two people falling in love romantically and, and hopefully spending the rest of their life together in that sense. It's much more significant than that, even for Christians. Christians, is uh, Western marriage can be about falling in love, but much more importantly... When we decide to make a promise to love and serve and, 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 and live in Christian marriage, then it's actually part of God's witness to the world about how he loves us. Look at what Paul says about marriage in this chapter. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He's elevating that love between husband and wife to how Christ loves the church. That's a huge your benchmark, isn't it? The, 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 uh, the bar is set very high. But, it's, but it's, it's this idea that marriage is meant to be a witness to how Christ loves the church, how Christ relates to the church, and how the church serves Christ in that way, and gave himself up for it. So that's why husbands need to be giving ourselves up for our wives. Now, we'll come to that next week as we look at it. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, <coughs> and the two will become one flesh. That's from... Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 and Paul and Jesus and others in the New Testament who write and, and speak about marriage whenever they speak about it they go back and say look Jesus was asked about divorce and he was asked about all sorts of things and he said yeah this is the reason we have these things is from a fallen world 
But actually, what God wants for marriage is go back to creation at the start. And they believed that was true. A man shall leave his father and mother and join to be united to his wife, and the two will become one fresh. And then he goes on to say, this is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and his church. Our marriages, Christian, if you're married, and we're married, to, uh, you know, uh, our marriages should be reflecting Christ's love for his church. That's why Paul says the things he does about marriage. Because it reflects Christ's love for his church and in society and the relationships between men and women and the way that works out. And it all goes back to creation. So actually, it's not just for Christian marriage. This is for all marriages. That's why all marriages are good in that sense, all marriage, all Christian marriage based on, on how it is with God's word. Marriage is given as a visual picture of Christ's love for his church. If you look at the marriage service itself, if you... You know, I don't know the last time we had a, a wedding in the church here, but we, you know, many of you got married and you can perhaps remember the words for the service, or maybe you're so full of blissful love and everything, you do, it all went by in a blur. I don't know. But this is, I've said this a number of times when I've married people. It, it emphasizes this point. The Bible teaches us that marriage is a gift of God in creation, a holy mystery which man, in which man and woman become one flesh. It's God's purpose that as husband and wife give themselves to each other in love throughout their lives, they shall be united in that love just as Christ is, Christ is united with his church. That's why it's so important. So that means loving even when we feel like enemies. That means carrying on the relationship even when it falls down. And it's not good. That's why marriage is... Met. We, we, this is the whole point of it. It's not because we think it's a good idea to work at our marriages. It's because, as Christians particularly, our marriages ought to reflect Christ and his church. And of all people, we need to work at that. Now, I know there's all sorts of difficulties surrounding that. It's not straightforward in, in a lot of ways. It's not just straightforward thinking. And, and there are issues that we need to overcome with that. But I'm not, I can't go into all of them this morning. But this is the principle that Christ gives us. So both Christian and non-Christian marriage, but especially Christian marriages, we are all God's image bearers in our lives. And when we come together in marriage, that's how it should be seen, submitting ourselves to God and his word. So God joins us together. It's not just a random thing. It's meant to be a witness, and uh, it's meant to be a witness to the world. My identity is, is in God's image. It's not in how good my husband or my wife is. But I am a person made in God's image, therefore I reflect his image in my marriage. Or in my singleness, if that's me. Or in whatever situation I am, I reflect his, his, his image. And sin in the world has corrupted all of that and changed it. It's in rebellion against that. We are sinful, so no marriage is ever going to be perfect. But we strive to submit to God's word within the marriage and as I say we'll look at this more detail next week but the marriage but what does marriage say about marriage in the bible and let's be clear about this this is what the bible says it's a monogamous it's between one man and one woman and it's for all of life and it's the only place for sexual intimacy there's nowhere in the bible that says anything different to that that's what bible tells us marriage is true marriage and anything outside of that isn't marriage according to god's word that's not because we want to be killjoys or anything like that. It's what God says. And all, the question we have to say is, are we going to submit to God's word, to God's plan, to God's good design or not? According to God's good design, however much we would like to label it, however much well-meaning we are, however much the different people are in love, it comes from creation, as we said and we read before. So it applies to all creation. And whenever Jesus and Paul talk about marriage, they always go back to that time as well it's very clear so we as believers we don't change the bible that's a principle isn't it the principle we've been talking about this morning if god's word is god's word to us inspired by god we accept it and we submit to its authority in our lives and so the question really underneath all of this are we willing to do that are we willing to submit to god's word in everything especially when it challenges us will we give in to god and his submission uh, and submit to him so we do submit to it humbly we should not be ashamed of god's word we should profess it joyfully and we should confess our sin humbly when we depart from it knowing that god's word also tells us that we can rejoice that we are forgiven in grace when we come to the cross and let's face it all of us have failed has anyone here you can put your hand up if you like 
if you've got a perfect marriage. I'm sure there won't be. You see, it's not like that, is it? Anyone lived with, 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 and, 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 and never not submitted to God's word and never sort of come to the point where you've chosen to go against God's word? I'm sure we have. Anyone struggle with temptations? Anyone struggle with sin? Anyone struggling with besetting sins? Well, if we were to be honest with each other this morning, we could be here all day, couldn't we? Because that's the way it is. But God's word tells us that we still submit to it, even though it's difficult in every area, and particularly in these areas here. So we don't. So that's important to understand because we don't stand in judgment as people or as church on the world. So when people come into church or into, into our relationships in any way and they have a lifestyle that's different to ours, they're standing outside of the world, we don't stand in judgment upon them. But what we do is we stand by God's word and God's word will, uh, will be, if, if there's going to be any judge anyway, it's going to be God through his word. And, and what will happen, they'll either... But the person, the people could, society will either conform to God's word or it won't. But they'll make the choice. But it's not for us to judge people, is it? Because there's only one judge. And so next week we're going to look what Christian marriage looks like. The more straightforward look at it, kind of what does this passage say to us? And how are we going to submit in our homes, in our marriages, in our families, with children and parents and things? We'll look at all that next week. But for this morning, the application as we finish. And the question we need to ask, a very underlying question in our lives who are you submitting to or what are you submitting to who, ultimately it's kind of this who are you trying to please remember last week we said as a christian our main aim should be try to find out what pleases the lord and we do that through his word it's the only way we're going to find out what pleases the lord it's actually really important isn't it because it's a matter of life and death who or what are you going to give yourself up for or to? Are you going to give yourself up to make life easier in the world? Or are we going to submit to God's word, which sometimes puts us in a difficult position with the world, but not with God? Who are you submitting to? Who have you chosen to give yourself up to or for? Are you reading and trusting God's word? Do you know what God's word says about these things? Are you confident to stand on what God's word says about these things and confidently, joyfully proclaim it and profess it to a world that needs to hear it? Because that's the truth of it, isn't it, this morning? Despite the noise, despite the difficulty, how is God's word impacting your life now? What has God said to you through his word in the last week or so? It has challenged you because God's word will challenge you because we've got sinful hearts that are always departing from it. That's what I said before. None of us are, are innocent with this. So when our hearts are being challenged by God's word, who are we submitting to? Are we coming back to his word? Are we arguing with God? Are we holding out? Are we trying to brush it under the carpet? It's a principle that goes right beyond this whole marriage thing as well. It's in all sorts of areas, isn't it? How is God's word impacting my life? Do you believe what he says about marriage in his word? If you're married, how is your, if you're married, how is your marriage going? Does your word reflect Christ and his church? Does your marriage reflect Christ and his church? Does it? What do we need to do to fix it? To submit to his word? Is it a witness to the world? Do we need to submit and repent to one another if you, oh, and to God? It's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? It's all right saying we believe these things, but folks, we need to go out and live this out in the world. The life in the light of holiness in our behaviour, the life in the light of God's love, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and our behaviour in our own homes, in our church, in our workplace. It matters and it can only count if we're submitting all of that to what God has said in his word. And next week we'll find out more details about what that's all about. But the questions are still there. Where do you find your identity? Who are you trying to please? Your heavenly father or those in the world around us? hard-hitting questions I guess this morning and I pr pray that we'll think about them and pray about them and in your, in your life groups this week you can pick up some of these things as well and talk about it and help each other but let's pray together now as we finish this morning Heavenly Father we thank you for your word to us this morning we thank you Lord for its authority we thank you for its directness we thank you for its clarity and Lord we pray that you give us submissive hearts ready to submit to you and your word in everything Lord that we would put you uh, at the top of the list of everything, that we would seek to live a life that glorifies you in the light of your word. 
however difficult that might be and however countercultural it might be, Lord, you give us the strength that we need through your Holy Spirit to stand firm on the word that you've given us. And we ask this in Jesus' name.